Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining my session and welcome. I'm really excited to be here and I appreciate you being interested in what I have to share with you today. My session um, during this time period is how OKRs can be coupled with performance. My name is Caitlin Collins. I'm an organizational psychologist and a principal implementation consultant at BetterWorks. Uh, my career has been focused on building performance enablement programs for global organizations. And I've also, early on in my career, spent a number of years as a trauma specialist, which I am sharing with you as it's been the one of the most impactful experiences that I've had that really drives a lot of the work I do with our customers and with organizations I worked with. I take a very people-centric approach to help foster environments that respond to stress, trauma, change, neurodiversity, which is a topic that's very close to my heart, but all in the end to enable cultures and environments and programs that really help drive growth and development and just have people enjoy their jobs and the work that they do. For our session today, um, I'm going to start off at the very beginning and talking about performance management and performance enablement. I find a timeline or at least understanding the history of how we got to where we're at, how we measure performance is really interesting. And I think that there's value in really understanding how we got to where we are and what this process really means or what it started off meaning. Um, and so I'll just say in understanding where in the world that it came from, um, we can blame the United States for this and a little bit of Europe. But during the industrial revolution, so we're going to start off way in the beginning of time, um, we started to create systems that we were able to use to document, sorry, I'm just moving a chat around, document productivity of humans alongside machines so that we would be able to better understand how to get better, more productive, and get to the end result faster. Then during World War II, uh, we created a process or the military created a process of a merit system that enabled us to be able to get rid of uh, poor performers, which in the end enabled us to more move these people, and this is the sad part, but move these people to the front lines during battle. Then we move on to World War II. And during World War II, we started to say, okay, how can we reinforce uh, the process of identifying this type of merit system? How can we reinforce the process of identifying high performers or identifying soldiers that would be that had potential to become officers? Then still staying in the 1940s we take a look at really understanding how do we reinforce this positive behavior of a system that we're starting to implement in the army in during war. An organization started to adapt this process and create systems around being able to document performance to allocate rewards and really create benefits for high performers. We jump forward to the 1960s and GE comes into play here. And GE said, with the system that had been running for the last 20 years, GE says that this is now an opportunity that we can leverage to help use as a development tool. So let's better utilize it so that we can help grow our people to help lower turnover. We recognize that a high performing organization is one that keeps their people for a very long time. And this is at a stage where it's the end of the Eisenhower era and people were, or employees were really noted as company men, um, as far as staying with organizations for the lifetime of their career. Then we jump forward another decade and we look in the 1970s and inflation starts to rise. And what happens is, is we start, or organizations start to not really be able to afford compensation or merit pay increases for all of their employees. So they need a way to be able to objectively understand how do we have a focused process where we can only provide merit increases to certain people which become our high performers and we really start to lean into a performance rating score. In the next decade, in the 1980s, 
good old GE took another stab at the process and said, let's take it one step further and let's award only our top performers. We're going to keep our employees that are middle ranked from a performance rating perspective, and we're going to let go all of our, high, our low performers. And this is how we see a high performing organization to really sustain itself is by cycling out low performers and bringing new people in. But then we fast forward another 20 years and we look at the turn of the century and organizations start to become flatter as a trend. Organizations to me, I often look at them depending on their maturity level and often it doesn't matter how long they've been established, but more often than not, I sometimes view organizations like teenagers in that they love to follow a trend. So when one organization raises their hand and says, okay, we've been really successful at being flat and here's how we did it. Everybody else wanted to learn how to follow suit and said, okay, that's something we need to do too. But what happened with larger organizations as they start to flatten their hierarchy is our really good managers started to take on a lot more direct reports. So we're looking at a process where we're leaning into this performance rating and it's starting to become even more cumbersome than it originally intended to be. And it's something that we're just not really falling in love with. Then we go into the 2010s and Agile hits the scene, but I will admit to you, Agile's been along, around long before uh, 2010, um, but it becomes a trend where we're understanding a different way of working and we're starting to apply the concept outside of just product engineering and technical teams to different parts of organizations. And the pot really starts to boil because now we're looking at outcomes and end result processes differently. And it process becomes of annual performance reviews become even a bigger tax for managers within organizations and HR departments. Basically, what this timeline is telling us in a nutshell is since the 1700s, we've really just all been trying to figure it out. We're all trying to understand how do we get to a place of something that people enjoy, that works for us, that enables us to drive performance and growth. Our end result ultimately is to have high performing people so we can be a high performing organization. The problem has been that we've all been staring at the outcomes and not necessarily putting enough tension on the fundamentals or the behaviors in achieving those outcomes. And I'll give you an example. It was um, because this is what I can relate to. As a child, I played the piano for decades. So it would be as if I was a conductor, let's just say, of an orchestra, and you're coming in as a piano player on my, on my orchestra, and I say, um, are you ready to go? We're going to be playing in a symphony. Here's a sheet of music I'd like for you to play. And you're like, great, I've got it. I studied piano as a kid. I learned it in school or learned it as a kid, studied it in school. I've had a piano teacher before. I know how to read music. I know what I'm doing. And I say, okay, that's awesome. I'm, you know, minus your audition. I'm going to trust and we're going to make this thing happen and make this thing work. And I'm so sorry. I just got a puppy. <laughs> so we're going to have to work and talk through the barking. Um, so outside of that, what I wouldn't do, so if I'm now listening to you and preparing for you to play within the symphony inside of the orchestra, what I wouldn't do is continue to rank you or mark you as a mediocre performer that's not necessarily exceeding expectations. I think that is something that we call the definition of insanity, where we're doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. But in order for me to be able to help you improve, instead, what I need to do is focus on those fundamentals instead of the outcomes of the music. That's one data point. But instead of me telling you you're not hitting the mark, what I need to do is sit down and coach you on maybe how to play a little bit differently, fix your tempo, fix the order in which you are reading or playing that music because maybe there's something that you're just not seeing that I would be able to help teach you with. So, oops, organizations in and of themselves or as a whole can evaluate performance of their employees in a lot of different ways. And I'm willing to bet based on the organizations that you each represent that each one of you do something, a variation of the same thing, but each one of you do something a little bit different. 
And as we have evolved to really understand the power that coaches and leaders have to help develop and enable our employees, more so than being a boss or having strict supervision, many organizations still have continued to really hold on to their annual review process. And we know we don't love it. We know our people don't love it. Nobody gets excited about it at the end of the year when you're wrapping things up and are, yes, I cannot wait for my 2360 performance reviews to be able to fill out. And if we're going to be honest with each other, I don't think anybody recognizes really what the value that it drives. So what we want to do is um, instead of taking, spending a lot of time and really evaluating people's strengths, weaknesses or areas for improvement, achievement through KPIs or goals that we're trying to use evidence of what our employees have accomplished throughout the year, um, filling out a ton of different 360 feedback or peer reviews or annual reviews. You know, and then we throw in a list of competencies and it just becomes a process that really takes so much time and hours and hours for managers and individuals to complete. And there are reports and data that shows organizations have proved that this process, um, I think it, the data shows for organizations that are 10,000 or people or more, this is a process that costs them millions of dollars a year. And the conclusion to all of this, all the problem is that as organizations, we're really using the wrong data in order to drive our decision making for compensation and performance. So um, what we start to look at then is or ask ourselves or answer a question is how do we tie OKRs to performance ratings in compensation decisions? And if you're an organization that's used to doing that or has a process in place where you've done that with a type of goal setting methodology or KPIs, it becomes even a bigger question, even a bigger conundrum, conundrum to try and figure out and versus if you were just starting fresh and this was a brand new process that you were putting in place. Um, linking OKR achievement directly to performance or compensation does have some damaging consequences. And there's good reason why literature, why people within this space have advised organizations not to do that. And that's because when we're talking about OKR achievement, what we're doing is really drawing on a certain and a specific behavior that's causing people to make this be a process that's not working, which is that people tend to set OKRs that are easy for them to achieve at 100%. They create a situation where they're really sandbagging their own potential um, so that they can control the outcomes. But this is something that leads to a lack of innovation and is really less valuable to organizations. People put less focus on collaborative initiatives and collaborative OKRs because, again, they want to be able to control that outcome. And at the end of the day, it ends up being a process where people aren't really that excited about it. They're really not that engaged with it. And it becomes just a task or something to check off the list to make sure they have that completed by the end of the year. There is a great deal of confusion. I hear it all the time around how OKRs fit into compensation and performance reviews. And a lot of that comes from why OKRs should be divorced from compensation or kept completely separate. And this primarily exists to make sure that there's no confusion on the purpose of OKRs. We want employees to be able to embrace the OKR process because it's one that shouldn't, and when done well, doesn't limit their potential, their ambitious support of an organization, and their own personal or professional career growth. If compensation is something that you think of when you're in the process of creating your own OKRs, you're going to immediately, even if you don't initially know it at not or know it at all, sorry, but you're going to immediately start to skew the outcome or the description of what you're describing your OKR to be so that you can protect your own interests, which is your safety and security within work. And I will say I haven't met an organization yet 
that wants their employees to perform less than their potential, less than what they know they're able to do. So giving space to empower employees, even through failure, drives success and innovation for an organization. It drives success and innovation for teams and really advances the capabilities and the knowledge and skills of our individual employees. OKRs are meant to provide employees with a chance to be able to stretch themselves and not settle. OKRs allow employees to be able to think bigger about their day-to-day -day responsibilities, even if it's their OKRs at first are primarily developmental. But allowing employees to do this will change the traditional review process. As an employee, if I know that every mistake that I make that every misstep that occurs or something that I cause will impact my safety and security, my, which is my overall performance that indicates my job security, my growth, my earning potential. I have to ask myself, why would I stretch myself if I could settle? When we see employees who have that safety to be able to create OKRs to stretch themselves, that ability to be able to fail before they learn how to get it right. It really adds value to their growth and provides agency to what they care about. They're able to focus on what they want to achieve. And this achievement increases, or OKR achievement increases 60% across an organization. This belief that OKR achievement, which should be the priority of our people and our teams as they work to execute on company strategy, are not a useful data point in performance is kind of um, a system that we can focus on really learning how to understand better. And to be able to avoid the problems by linking OKR achievement to performance and compensation, instead we have to look at a little bit differently. So what does that solution look like? What does that solution look like and what do we do instead? It becomes a process where instead of thinking about the achievement of OKRs, we need to link the approach, how people approach and complete and really challenge themselves to OKRs. That is instead of focusing on measuring the outcomes to performance, we're focusing on measuring the fundamentals or the behaviors that lead to the outcomes that we're hoping for. Recognizing that directly linking OKR achievement is, some, is the problem and is a situation that doesn't really lend itself to drive a program that we're hoping to implement within our organization, we then have to make sure that we're, make, we're driving and indirectly linking that approach for OKRs. So what you see on your screen here, an easy way for us to be able to factor in those fundamentals is instead of really in a, in a performance review, instead of measuring um, how the, did the person complete their OKRs, yes or no, instead of measuring what percentage overall out of all of their OKRs did this person achieve in the last year, in the last quarter, or it could be a variation of that. Maybe we're weighting our OKRs and we're uh, corresponding that to certain performance criteria. Instead, what we want to start to measure is um, on a scale of one to three, how much did this person challenge themselves with their OKRs? Sorry about that. She's very excited about OKRs. Um, on a scale of one to three, how impactful were this person's OKRs? Your OKR program should already have certain levels of accountability that are included in the process in which the outcomes, the achievement levels are already established to make sure that that happens. We now need to focus on ensuring that we're reinforcing the right behaviors to make sure that people are doing this Op optimizing how they are creating and really approaching it. Um, so when we talk about um, an OKR performance and an OKR process, we have to talk about performance as a whole. Because as I mentioned earlier, OKRs are just one data point of a performance review process. And we know that the annual process doesn't work. I will preach it. If you don't know it yet, we can have a conversation and I will preach to you why. Maybe preach is the wrong word, but we can talk it out and explain why it's a process that doesn't work. But 
part of that is as managers, we know as people, as human beings, we know that our memories aren't always reliable. We forget stuff on how our people perform throughout the year. And we are all biased, whether we recognize it or not. And part of contributing OKRs to performance and compensation decisions means that we need to move away from an annual review model to one that is much more continuous. So if our OKR program, for example, is quarterly, our performance, continuous performance enablement program needs to follow suit and be more quarterly as well. And even if we're doing annual OKRs, I still recommend a quarterly performance enablement program. Because the purpose of that is to be able to accurately capture how people are showing up to work. Performance is not something that happens every once in a while. It is not episodic. It is something wherein we show up and we show up to work every day and whether we're having a good day or a bad day, or we have a dog barking at our feet in the middle of a presentation. <laughs> she heard me say that. It is a process in which we have to be able to capture that very effectively. I'm really sorry. I can't figure out to get her to stop. Okay, so it's a process. We're just going to go with it. She's just going to be the entertainment in the background. And I hope that nobody is as annoyed as I am right now because I know I'm the one that's trying to talk through it. Um, but there are four parts to a continuous... One second. <laughs> there are four parts to a continuous performance enablement process. And the first one is short-term OKRs. Are we focused on the right things at the right time? And by supporting our employees to create shorter term goals, it enables them to be able to stay focused on what is important today and to stay on track with their development, as well as it enables the whole of the organization to be able to execute on strategy and pivot more effectively. The second part is feedback and recognition. And personally, I do a lot of classes on feedback. I see that feedback is tremendously valuable when it is done well. And that is a difficult program to be able to implement. Not impossible. It just takes reinforcement, learning, and patience, and a little bit of kindness and grace to be able to put that in and make that go well. But it becomes a tool, especially when we learn how to give feedback on on OKRs that people have agency and ownership over, it becomes a tool that is really meaningful and powerful for everyone. And recognition as part of that process is just something that makes us feel good. It reinforces the right behaviors and makes us feel seen and appreciated at work. The third element is coaching or having conversations with our direct reports, which is, to check in on how they're doing, how they're feeling, and better to better be able to coach them on the right path forward, especially if there are behaviors or knowledge or information that we need to be able to curtail more quickly or reprioritize and pivot them in a different direction. The fourth part are regular evaluations. Now, I might, I'm not saying, what I'm not saying is to take an annual performance review process and copy and paste that every quarter. My ultimate suggestion is we need to strip it down and make it as lightweight as possible. I honestly advocate for our review process that's probably four to six questions on both sides. But we want to make sure that we are regularly giving an overall account or a overall summary or accountability, something that is specific and transparent to our employees. No one should get to the end of the year during this process, no one should get to the end of the year and feel shocked about their performance review. If I think I'm performing well, and I learn that maybe I'm not performing as well as I thought, I would rather have had that information as an employee during the course of the year so I could have changed my focus, I could have put more efforts behind certain abilities or capabilities that I needed to enhance, or I would better understand why I was where I was at. We might not necessarily need to give a rating, but as long as from a manager perspective, as long as we're able to provide a response that gives enough information so that we have that transparency and employees are on track, I think it's really to the benefit of everyone, especially the organization. So that's to say, encapsulating that 
performance needs to be more strategic. It needs to move from an event-driven process to something that really enables people and how they show up for work every day. Um, for all the interruptions that we've had. So we've got a few key takeaways. I know I've got a few minutes left, but I just want to leave you all with a few questions of things to think about is when you're thinking about really applying OKRs to your organization, if you've got a process where an OKRs don't link to performance, that's awesome. I don't, I don't think you necessarily need to make those changes today, but if it's something that you've been really struggling with and questioning, how do we do this? I think it can be a mechanism, especially when we're looking at adoption and engagement, it can be a powerful mechanism that really reinforces the value of how these are important in organizations. So think about how do you see OKRs really impacting your performance and your compensation decisions within HR, within the scheme of things within your organization. And on that note, if we think about the opposite side of that coin, what are the primary roadblocks you may face when or if you're able to implement a structure of something that looks like this? I think it's important to look at the ambition of where we wanna go and to really be honest with ourselves about the things that are gonna get in our way to be able to achieve that. So I'll leave you with one last summarization sentence, which is in all of this is to say when we're making these critical decisions, and they are critical, they're things that impact the success of our organization, our financial health, and the ability and the happiness of our people. It's important that we focus on the right data, which is the fundamentals or the behavior versus always measuring the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Um, I see I have a few questions that are coming in, and before I get distracted in all the questions, um, I just wanted to let you know that up next we have, after this session, um, we have a 15-minute break in between this one and the next one, and then you're going to come back and hear our Chief Product Officer, Arno as he shares an exclusive first look at the BetterWorks platform roadmap, including our platform vision, future and an exciting sneak peek into sneak peek into key product launches that we have coming up for 2022. Okay, so I'm not done yet. I see we've got some questions, but I just want to make sure I didn't forget about that. Um, is let's see, I'm going to take a second just to read through the chat. So the first question I see is, are there any downside to OKR methodology? That's a really good question. I have to say, I will admit, I've never been asked that before. Um, I don't, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. I think that more so than focusing on downside to an OKR methodology, um, I think the difficulty about implementing OKR methodology is ensuring that we have the right uh, change management process in place. I've had um, someone once tell me that they were expecting it to be a program where they could just pick up their phone and people would easily be able to understand how to use it. And that's true for the technology, but the program part is something that we need to reinforce. We need to teach people how to flex and exercise a new muscle. And if we are saying it's important to our organization, we need to make it important to the organization and talk about it. So I think as long as you have a good program team in place to manage it, a good change management um, practice to better enable it, then you give yourself some time and patience for that system to really take effect within the culture. Um, I think that's the part we need to make sure that you focus on. Uh, should OKRs be set individually or done in groups, teams, and cascaded down to individuals? Um, you know, that's a good question. I think I'm going to give you a very HR response and say that depends. I think it depends on the function, on how the function of the roles and how far down we take them and what our frontline or individual contributor roles look like. For a number of organizations, taking it all the way down to the individuals is really successful. Um, for other structured organizations that might be in manufacturing, our individual contributors might be out in the field somewhere, whatever the case is, we want to still have them evolve, involved. So maybe it is from a team perspective that they're contributing to an overarching OKR. Whatever that case is, is from a strategic standpoint, that needs to be designed out. But I think that all individuals, wherever they are, can still own development OKRs, which can only move us all forward together. 
Um, I think we've got one minute left, so I don't want to keep you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, get to another question, but I'm still happy to do address them later on if I, there's a bunch of that I've missed. Should OKRs be the only data used to assess employees' performance? My short answer to that question is no. It doesn't have to be. I think OKRs are like a tent pole are a good data point to be able to include in this, um, but there will be other outputs that um, likely will need to be considered as far as making those performance and compensation decisions. Um, okay, so I think that is all I was able to get to in the time that we have. Thank you very much for joining me during this session. I really appreciate your patience and kindness with my uh, distractions, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you all so very much.